right, let's see. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Sound great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the kind welcome, and thank you very much to the Sears and, and, and the scale. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come here and present. Uh, <clears throat> I work for a company called Missilesphere in San Francisco, and uh, we're uh, we're providing services commercialization of an open source project called Apache Mesos. So uh, just a little bit of background, Apache Mesos uh, became a top level project in the uh, Apache Foundation uh, this summer. And uh, it had been incubated uh, for a while before that. It came out of uh, a friend of mine's PhD dissertation at Berkeley, uh, out of what's now called AMP Lab, it used to be Rad Lab. Uh, but Ben Hinman was the author of it. And I worked with him at Mises here. So um, this might be a little bit a little bit less contrast than I'd like, uh, but it's an interesting shot that I grabbed. There's actually a link there from where the source was. Uh, it's a list of all the different Linux contributors, the different organizations that have contributed the most uh, patches in terms of the modern kernel. And going down the list, in the top 10 or so, you've got Google. It's very interesting because Google's done a lot of work on the Linux kernel. And a lot of that, a, a big part of what they've committed has to do with something called C groups. So let me ask, how many people have worked with C groups before? Anybody? How about in terms of Solaris? Anybody worked with zones or heard of zones? Okay, good. C groups is basically if if you're uh, if you're an old Linux or sorry an old uh, Unix hand, uh, and, and I could probably be guilty of that. Uh, definitely, the Linux community has evolved a similar notion of isolation uh, since about 2.6. So since about 2006, it's been part and parcel of the Linux kernel. And the, uh, the reason for that is what I'm going to go through in terms of this talk here. Uh, leading up to the fact that Mesos, Apache Mesos, is an open source implementation of this. So <clears throat> Google, taking a look at what they've been doing with the concept of data center computing, data center as a computer, um, this has been going on for a number of years. The idea is that Google doesn't use virtual machines. They use isolation instead. And they make a really big point of this because it, it gains amazing amounts of efficiency for them. And when you're building and operating billion dollar data centers, the change between 8% utilization rate and 40% utilization rate can be measured in terms of a lot of dollars. So this is, this is a big deal. Uh, one of the things that Google makes a point out of in some of their papers <clears throat> is that on the clusters, you'll see maybe 80% of the jobs are batch. But yet, when you really look at where the resources are being allocated, 80% is going towards services. So they run these big warehouse data centers. They run uh, mixed workloads. And the interesting thing is that a real priority, sorry, I'm probably walking around a lot. Got the, okay, I'll try and stay in one place. Um, you've got these mixed workloads in the data centers. And the real priority is in terms of services. If you can cut down the latency on the workloads you're pushing through, and you can combine both the batch and the services together to boost your utilization, uh, then you can, you can bring a better product, basically. In a, in a lot of kinds of businesses, you can measure the revenue, or the loss of revenue, rather, by milliseconds in terms of latency. And certainly, if you're doing really large-scale search, like Google is, uh, that's very much the case that they make. One of the things that we've seen is that when people are putting together clusters, you might have a cluster over here for Hadoop, and a cluster over here for Memcache, another cluster for Ruby on Rails for serving it, uh, typical kinds of architectures like that. At the end of the day, though, you end up with a lot of clusters. And one of the problems is you end up spending a, a lot of resources on effectively a wire tax. Basically, you, you create your data products in Hadoop over here, but then you have to ship them out into your cache or into your web apps or wherever it's going to be consumed. Now, if you can mix those workloads together, Number one, you can cut down that wire tax of shipping the data across to a different cluster. But also, by virtue of mixing the workloads, you can uh, leverage multi-tenancy to get much higher utilization rates. So Google makes the point that scheduling batch, it's a problem, but it's not that hard of a problem. Um, scheduling services, on the other hand, is a, a very hard problem. And typically, what people do to contend with that is just throw more resources at it. Okay, so in terms of Hadoop, uh, you know, definitely uh, done a lot of work with Hadoop. That's kind of the context of what we're talking about here, uh, and it does great things. 
Um, but there's more beyond Hadi that we're, we're trying to surface here, we're trying to focus on, in the sense of the full analytics lifecycle. We're creating a lot of large-scale data products in Hadoop, but we're consuming them maybe in real-time kinds of use cases or serving them out of web apps for APIs, uh, et cetera. Uh, so there's definitely been a lot of work at, as I mentioned, UC Berkeley in uh, their EDCS program. There's a lab called AmpLab, which has had some phenomenal work coming out of it. Uh, Mesos was one of the early projects, and then out of Mesos, one of the spin-outs was Spark. So are y'all for a Spark, I can imagine. Um, on top of Spark, there's Shark, and there's BlinkDB, and a lot of other things happening. But basically, we're looking at a next generation for these open source, big data frameworks. And we're really taking a page from what Google has been doing, what little bits they've been publishing. And frankly, uh, some of the people at AppLab actually have worked at Google. Uh, there's definitely cases where like, people on the Mesos team were formerly doing similar work at Google. Okay. So <clears throat> Google is notoriously uh, secret about some of the things they do. I, I live literally Google's in my backyard. Um, I can throw a rock and hit them. Um, and you know, you, you hear things at kiddos' birthday parties and barbecues and whatnot. But other than that, they're, they're pretty tight-lipped about things. Um, as far as how they run the data centers, though, there are a few good primary sources that have come out. One of them was, surprisingly, uh, Kate Metz had a uh, interview you know, with uh, John Wilkes. Uh, John Wilkes runs the Omega team at Google, so that's sort of the latest generation of how to run data centers. Kate Metz published an interview with John Wilkes and also with Ben Hinman from Mesos in Wired uh, earlier this year. It's called Return of the Borg, and it, it's pretty enlightening. Uh, I was actually very surprised about how much detail they went into. Um, there's a book that's now in a second edition, um, uh, the Barroso and Halse, uh basically data center as a computer. And it doesn't go into a lot of details about the specifics of Borg or Omega or, or these projects internally at Google, but it does tell you more about the shape of how they're used, the philosophy of how they're used. But a real eye-opener is actually a, a 2011 video uh, from Google's Academic Summit in the UK. And uh, John Wilkes, Google had hired him out of HP some years back, a uh, very, very senior architect. Uh, anyway, John Wilkes is leading the Omega effort, and uh, there's a video up on YouTube where he talks a lot about their approach and their priorities, uh, what they've been up to. Uh, so I highly recommend those. Um, but what's, what's really the most transparent of all of this is a paper that came out. Uh, it was for Eurosys. It was published this year, but it was actually written in 2012. But it's called Omega. And uh, some of the authors there are, well, they're all Google people, but some of them were from Berkeley Hamp Lab. Uh, Andy Konwinski, for instance. Um, this is a really interesting paper because Google went and took cluster traces, their cluster traces, as well as public cluster traces from Yahoo and Twitter and some other firms. And they ran a lot of simulations about how to do scheduling. They're really trying to understand the problem of multi-tenancy and utilization and latency in a large data center. So they're running a lot of these workloads through, and, uh, and they actually took their simulators. Uh, one of them they've made open source now, so you can go on Google Code and, and get their, their scheduler simulator. But um, an interesting thing here is that Google came out with terminology about how to, how to classify different kinds of schedulers. So on the left-hand side, you've got a uh, representation for what they would call a monolithic scheduler. Um, this would be the class of Google Borg, which has been around for years now. Um, another one which they say fits into this category, although Irvin Murthy disagrees with me, um, is Yarn. And the issue is that Google has, in their experience, found some real problems with having a monolithic scheduler. There are bottleneck problems, and they try to demonstrate that through uh, the knee and the curve of where the scheduler actually gets in the way after a certain scale of the tasks that are being run on the cluster. Like I say, some of my colleagues uh, who work on Yarn um, ha have some serious disagreements with that, um, and I'll let them speak to it. But the Google people are pretty adamant about what, they're, what they've found as well. So maybe someday we could have a debate. Um, in the middle column, though, is what Google is calling a two-level scheduler. 
And circa 2012, that was Mesos. Um, so Mesos has been around for four years. Started out as Ben Hinman's PhD thesis at, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, it's been in production at scale at Twitter for two years. So Twitter and their ramp up for their revenue apps leading up to their IPO, uh, they really relied on Mesos a lot. And I'll, I'll have some quotes about this later on. But they've been one of the biggest committers and one of the biggest advocates of it. Also the largest public use case, not necessarily the largest use case. Um, in the third column is a research goal. And so this is not from production yet, but it's what Google is trying to shoot for. It's a project called Omega, and it's the idea of having a, a, what they call a shared state scheduler. So the notion there is, uh, could you take a process that's arbitrarily running out in a cluster, that maybe that's a hotspot for the cluster, could you do process migration? Basically kill it, pull its state over to a different part of the cluster has more resources and reinstate it there. Um, that's the goal. That's actually a very hard problem doing shared state across a large cluster. And when we say large, the numbers are pretty big. I mean, Google's, Google has you know, tens of thousands of, of servers, multi-core servers in these, in these data centers. Twitter, in their use cases, uh, they're typically running about 150,000 cores per cluster. And they run multiple clusters of that. So it's, it's pretty big, pretty big stuff. Now, um, having said this, uh, this paper was really written in 2012, and uh, there are definite criticisms for everybody there. Um, we've taken that to task. Uh, Twitter and others, Berkeley and others, and some of our team have been involved in adding new parts into Mesos to address some of the concerns. Um, one of the biggest things was about doing highly available services. So being able to schedule batch, being able to schedule Hadoop and Spark and MPI um, that's been in Mesos, being able to go out and run you know, 100 Ruby on Rails processes and be able to monitor those for highly available services, uh, that was something that's been added. So essentially, we're moving more towards the Omega case. Twitter also committed work on distributed logs, which is essentially multi -paxos. So we really are getting a little bit more towards shared state. And if you want to take a look at what the, uh, what the real business case is for this, there's a, a great video uh, Jeff Dean did at ACM out in uh, a user group meeting that we had out in the Bay Area recently. Um, <clears throat> he's talking about latency. He's talking about mixed workloads in a large data center. And the idea is that if you have processes that might have you know, tens of millisecond response, typically, for their profiles, but maybe they have 99th percentile one second response. You kind of get that long tail thing. Um, you, can, you can manage that typically by throwing resources at it. You can still get your SLA. But if you have workloads like Google has, where you have this big fan app, one process calls five other processes that call 100 other processes, and you have to do that to be able to deliver your results within milliseconds, that 99th percentile case can just kill your entire workload. Um, so Jeff Dean does a really good job here of describing how they approach this, again, using isolation. Okay, so that brings us to Mesos. Um, the idea is that this is something which is you know, eminently scalable to tens of thousands of nodes. Um, at Berkeley, they've done work at you know, 30,000, 50,000 kinds of uh, clusters uh, for servers. Obviously, multi-cores, there's a lot more cores. Uh, and beyond that, you start getting some problems in terms of networking, really, in terms of the messaging going back and forth. But that's still pretty sizable. Uh, again, this is really pointed at getting rid of virtual machines. So using isolation, actually running on the kernel, running as a distributed kernel. Uh, the idea with C groups is that you have a number of um, ad hoc tags, ad hoc resources that you can name. It's kind of like a tree directory for describing the resources on a given server. So you can have tags for describing um, how to isolate in terms of CPU, upper, lower bounds and CPU, how to isolate in terms of RAM usage, how to isolate in terms of uh, network controller, or I.O. Um, certainly there's work on file system. File system is not just a one-dimensional thing. That's actually pretty complex to do isolation for that. We're working on that. Um, as well, you can go in and, and add tags. So you can have resources identified, say, a, a rack ID. 
or a switch ID. So if you know a given node is on a particular rack, then when you're sending out tasks, you can guarantee rack locality, or you can disperse it, make sure that you know, different processes are actually on different racks. And there's other ways, too, that this could be extended into software-defined networks, et cetera. Um, so it's pretty flexible. If you want to, you can add tags for data resources. Maybe you have a, a special Postgres database out in your cluster that has some metadata, and certain processes have to be close to it. Um, so it's very extensible. Um, now, as far as Mesos is concerned, we use uh, Zookeeper, but really it's just there for leader election. So we, we typically run a few masters. Like we'll have a cluster that has, say, three masters in it. And the masters are really there just to keep track of, of where the different leafs in the cluster are. Um, it's, they have very lightweight state. Zookeeper is just really used for determining which one is the leader. And the philosophy being that it's extremely inexpensive to bring up a new master if you have to. Most of the state is actually out in the leaves. So the slaves are the ones who have the, the heavy lifting in terms of state. But Zookeeper comes in handy. Um, the code that's running Again, this is mostly based on Linux kernel, so the code is in C++. And it, it's kind of an interesting style of C++. It's a little bit newer. Um, it, it actually uses actor patterns in C++. Um, actor pattern, I should say. So um, pretty interesting work there. There's also uh, definitely APIs, bindings for Java and Python. Uh, we do a lot of work in Scala, so JVM in general. Um, and I'll show a little bit later here. There's a, a UI, a console, for being able to take a look at the cluster state. Um, and definitely, we, you know, we've done work for Linux, uh, Solaris, we run on Mac OS, etc. Um, okay, so the idea of Mesos is, let me from the camera. Um, the idea of Mesos is that it's a distributed kernel. It's really running on top of Linux, it's providing a distributed kernel for resources, for doing a two-level scheduler. Uh, you know, taking a look at, at how Linux boots up, first process that runs is going to be initd or upstart, depending on where you are. So we have a, another building block in Mesos called Marathon, which is essentially a, a distributed initd. And then from there, initd usually launches cron. So we have another building block that's called chronos. It's a distributed cron. The idea is to deconstruct distributed frameworks. So let's drill down on that a bit. If you take a look at how do you you know, what are the real moving parts inside of Hadoop? If you had to build Hadoop from off-the-shelf components, what could you use? Um, the idea is you've got a job tracker. Job tracker is essentially a long-running process. You've got a task tracker, which is essentially a kind of distributed cron. You've got name node, really, depending on your distro. Um, you've got some kind of shared, some file system underneath, distributed file system. So the idea with Mesos was really taking a look at deconstructing what was going on with, with Hadoop, how could we implement building blocks so that if people wanted to come up with new types of distributed frameworks, they could basically leverage these building blocks. Spark, of course, is, came out of this, and in some ways, Spark represents that perspective. Taking a look at Hadoop, and how could we really rebuild this, leveraging some kernel, modern kernel features, and building blocks, and really take advantage of the fact that um, I use Hadoop a lot, but really it comes from work out of 2002. That's when MapReduce work was done at Google. And in 2002, we had very different price characteristics, price performance characteristics in terms of spinny disks and RAM and, and network and things like that. Um, many of, of those kinds of, of hardware realities have changed. And so Spark is trying to adapt to a little bit more contemporary expectations. Okay, so let's see how this going. Okay. Uh, the idea is, in terms of a general architecture, uh, you've got some resources down in your cluster. You've got a distributed file system over top of that. You've got a distributed kernel over the top of that. Marathon, like I say, it's like a distributed init. We call it a, a meta framework because we run it and then we launch other frameworks from it. So you can launch how do you? launch a job tracker out of Marathon, or launch MPI, or launch Rails, or MySQL, or other types of frameworks, Spark, etc. One of the things about it I should mention is one of the, the popular use cases for Mesos is the ability to run 
not just one Hadoop instance on a cluster, but possibly run several. So the idea is you could have a production cluster. You have your, your job tracker there. You might have multiple job trackers that are running for different, uh, you can think of it as like priority queues, different levels of priority. But then you could also be running your development work and your, your staging cluster right on the same hardware. And we're actually hearing that a lot from engineering managers because uh, typically in large use cases, if there's a, a mission critical set of jobs, those get locked down on the production cluster of ops owns those. And typically it's hard for, speaking as an engineering manager, it's sometimes hard for development managers to get resources. Um, by using a substrate like this, you could be running production and dev and test all in the same hardware. You don't have to split the data, duplicate the data. You don't have to buy additional clusters. By leveraging isolation, you have some guarantees that if something goes rogue in your development apps, it won't step on your production apps. And that's actually a pretty big value. Um, the other thing I'm showing up here is where Kronos is one of the things that Marathon would typically launch. And from Kronos, you can basically run anything uh, that you would from a, a Linux command line. So any kind of scripts or Hadoop jobs that you're firing off. Uh, you know, it could be Bash or Python. Uh, and it also has a lot of uh, a lot of interesting features for dependency graphs and retry logic. So really between those two components, we can cover a lot of the use cases for EDC on clusters. Okay. So um, Mesos was born out of a need to be able to run things like Spark and Storm and Hadoop all together. Uh, but then along with that, be able to run other types of scripts. So just trying to show here how that really fits together. Um, on the one hand, you're providing resources, but on the other hand, you're also getting telemetry about your cluster. You've got information for capacity planning. Um, there's also you know, GUI consoles to give you feedback for your ops people. Um, and also some good books there for down the road, what we can do in terms of security. Okay, so let me give a, a little visual then of how this fits together. Uh, back in the old days, definitely showing some of my age here, um, we had data centers that looked a bit like this. Uh, you, you had bare metal and you just ran your workloads on your, your different uh, Unix or Linux boxes. And you know, then we evolved to the point of having uh, VMs. So we could take from, you know, say, 100 machines in a cluster, maybe you'd have 300 VMs running. Um, it's interesting because conceptually it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can carve off some of those VMs for a head cluster, some of them for memcache, et cetera, et cetera. But it does give you more inventory in terms of your ops people have to manage. And there's also a small matter of the licensing cost. Um, and then there's also a not so small matter of the overhead that's incurred by using virtualization. I'll show some slides on that. It's actually something that uh, I was quite surprised when I, when I ran into some really good benchmarks on it. Uh, now, moving into a, a slightly more evolved practice, then you know, we encounter a lot of static partitioning. Uh, certainly on my work on you know, leveraging cloud using Amazon AWS, this is typically a kind of view we would have had. Uh, the idea, though, is that if you've got a Hadoop cluster, say, in yellow, and a Spark cluster in, in red there, um, you're partitioning off your VMs and one of the troubles there is you probably have to fork your data coming into the different clusters. Um, it's back to that model of having separate clusters hang the wire tags between them. So with Mesos, the idea is to make a data center look as if you had taken this collection of heterogeneous resources and provided them as if they were just one big computer. And just it's as if you, as Twitter says, you know, they point their engineers at it and it's like they're working on their laptop. So you can just peel off resources from that big, huge collection as is needed for the frameworks. And the frameworks then are communicating with the scheduler and with the kernel to run much more efficiently. So um, this is interesting in the sense of the, the kind of obvious things you'd expect, um, enhanced fault tolerance, performance, utilization, et cetera. 
production of CapEx, um, ops over edit, licensing, those are sort of the things that we expect out of this. But the, the benefits, which are a little bit more subtle, um, what we've been hearing is that it, it gives time for engineering, um, it really reduces the time to ramp up new services at scale. Because you can be working on, again, your laptop and not have to change out the plumbing a lot if you're going to go and, and deploy it on a 7,000 minute cluster. Um, the other big value part for this that we've been hearing is reduced latency. So it's kind of my earlier point, but if you can cut down the time between creating data products in batch and consuming them in services, that enables new types of use cases. In some cases, that's where the business is. And then the last point too, what we've been hearing a lot, is to enable dev and test to have access to production cluster. Um, <coughs> make sure that the new apps aren't stepping on the old, on the production apps' toes. Okay. So as far as virtualization, I, I think that um, OpenVZ had a pretty good case study of uh, really what are the costs of virtualization. This is one of the better studies I've seen. Taking mixed workloads and showing uh, you know, where the trouble spots are in terms of virtualization once you get in the situation of having a very heavily loaded cluster. So it's the services that get bogged down, particularly when you've got a lot of load. Um, that's, that's the big unspoken problem with virtualization. Also, there's the matter of when you do have static partitioning, when you have different clusters, there's a matter of utilization. So, uh, you know, this is what we've seen out of Twitter and Airbnb and some of the other uh, use cases that are public, is that if you can take these workloads and mix them, you can flatten out the utilization curves um, and really boost that up. Okay, so let me dive into some nuts and bolts then. Um, in terms of making an offer, uh, and the offer, again, is on several different dimensions. It, it's you know, CPU, RAM, network, etc. cetera. Um, you've got the Mesos master, which is communicating with a framework. So you can think of a framework as, say, a job tracker in Heavy. And then you've got communications down from the framework uh, down into the slave. You could think of slave as being, or rather an executor on a slave node. That could be a task tracker. And so when we're running Hadoop on Mesos, this is how that would run. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that Mesos makes offers up to the frameworks, some list of frameworks. And there's a, a pluggable scheduler algorithm there, a fair scheduler by default. But the frameworks uh, go in priority and they have the option to take an offer or pass on it. Um, and then from there, the frameworks are communicating out to the different executors, hey, I've got this resource, go ahead and consume it. But ultimately, uh, the tasks are running on the kernel. And so the kernel, that's where Mesos lives, the kernel has visibility in terms of what's available. Um, one of the interesting integrations we did recently was with Docker. Now, how many people have used Docker? Okay. How many people have heard of Docker, I should ask? Okay. okay so <laughs> okay, so, so uh, uh, you know, Do Docker is gaining a lot of traction in the Bay Area uh, and has had some amazing meetups and hackathons and things like that and a lot of press. Um, outside of the Bay Area, I'm not really sure. I'm trying to find that out. Um, but, but the idea is uh, that you could take and define an application in terms of how it's going to fit on top of an OS and basically containerize that and then ship it out onto your real OS and actually, without having a virtualization layer, you know, have those calls pass directly through into your operating system. So it's a nice fit with what we're doing in Mesos. It's another layer up above it. So you could have, say, a, a Python web app or a Ruby on Rails kind of web app that was containerized. Or maybe you're running some framework like Redis or, I don't know, MySQL, something like that. Um, you could containerize it and then just ship it out to the cluster and ops can change the parameters of how that fits on your, your distributed kernel. So here we've got, um, showing the pictures there, you've got a, a Docker registry of the different containers that you can find. There's a master one, but then there's also a possibility for a local repository too. Uh, we've got a Mesos cluster, got the, the master nodes there, and running Marathon on them. So Marathon being kind of a, a distributed in a deep. 
And then out on the, the slaves, the, the nodes, uh, we've got Docker running. So it can accept new containers coming in. So you can kind of think of this as like a, a tarball on steroids. You know, if, if you have the luxury of shipping an app as a tarball, that's great. But for a lot of applications, you can't get away with that. You've got to go fiddle something in, you know, slash Etsy and something else in the user lib. And you've got to make a lot of changes in a tarball, it just doesn't work. So this is basically kicking it up a notch beyond a tarball. Um, the idea here is that the Mesos master uh, goes through a few steps in terms of initializing, sorry. And then uh, there's a communication down to the executors on the slaves. Um, so I just tried to show, it'll probably be easy to read in the slides, and I'll have these published up on SlideShare tonight. Uh, but basically the trace of this is you start out, user requests a container to be deployed, that goes through Marathon, down through the master, that communicates out to the executors on the slaves, and they do their little dance through Docker down into LXC. LXC is the, the it's a library on top of C group, so it's something in common that both Mesos and Docker use. And then from there, go out to the registry, come back in, and run it. Uh, and it sounds like a real roundabout kind of thing, but it actually makes deployment of complex apps very easy. So again, this is gaining a lot of traction. One of the limiting factors for Docker was it was really just defined for Ubuntu. And, and frankly, a lot of our customers, our enterprise customers, are mostly RHEL or CentOS. Is it, I'm actually curious about that. For people from enterprise shops, are you using mostly RHEL? How about SendWest? How about Ubuntu? Anybody? Okay, so that's what I'd seen too. So Docker came out of the shoots only doing Ubuntu, so we're kind of like, you know, I don't know if that's going to fit. Um, but they've been working with Red Hat, so I know there's an integration coming up. Okay. Um, all right, let me jump into some use cases then. Uh, as far as the published use cases that I can talk about without having attorneys visit me, um, definitely Twitter. And uh, Airbnb have been two of the big ones that were, that were very public about it early on. HubSpot in Boston, also Media Crossing in Boston, they were a couple of startups that, that did something pretty early. Very interesting use cases. I've got a, a case study about Media Crossing that's coming out. Um, we've also seen uh, Kagito and Showthrough, Devicescape, Cloud Physics, OpenTable. Uh, there's a Chinese company, I, I'll call it Key, but I know I'm mispronouncing this categorized in the UK. So we've got a pretty good breadth of some large companies, some, some small startups. Um, but the interesting thing is it, it really covers a spectrum of uh, cluster environments. Some of these are running on-premise on bare metal. Some of these are running entirely in AWS. So that was one of the things we wanted to look at in terms of case studies is how does Mesos help them? What's the value problem if they're running on opposite sides of the spectrum there? You know, the on-prem versus the cloud. So uh, just you know, case in point, taking a look at opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, Twitter is very much on-prem, right? Because you've got to serve the timelines, you have real latency concerns with Twitter. Uh, now an interesting thing with Twitter is that they get very, very, very little revenue per click. They've got this huge click stream coming through, not a lot of revenue. Um, then again, they, they were, have, they've been able to pull over a half billion revenue in the past year, so they're doing pretty well on that. Uh, that just tells you some of the enormity of their click stream. <coughs> Airbnb, on the other hand, they run entirely in the cloud. And the thing is, if you're clicking inside of your account in Airbnb, you're probably going to spend money. You're probably going to spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars of money. That's the expected value. So they have a very high ratio of revenue to clicks. Um, so it was really kind of a spectrum there. Um, now, in terms of use cases, Airbnb was really looking at being able to have more flexibility than AWS would provide them. Like, for instance, they wanted to run CDH at scale inside of Amazon. Um, they, they didn't want to have their own data center for a variety of reasons. It was just less overhead for them to run on the cloud. But they wanted to be able to use CDH. They wanted to run Storm. They wanted to do a lot of different things in the cloud. And Amazon wasn't really moving fast enough on that account. So they had to tool some of them themselves. Um, they found they had a lot more flexibility, a lot simpler ways to orchestrate mixed workloads in the cloud by using this. On the other hand, Twitter uh, was looking all right, let's see, primarily at services. It was mostly about request response. Um, because 
in terms of Twitter's revenue apps, that's, that's where the money comes from. Uh, the type ahead, uh, any opportunities to inject ads into the stream. Um, the services have been the name of the game over the past couple of years as they're programming with IPO. So, you know, Twitter was interested in Rails and, and Sinatra, Jetty, things like that. Okay, so as far as case studies, uh, Chris Fry is uh, SVP <coughs> at, at Twitter, and uh, he's had some nice things to say. Basically, uh, it, it's one of their keys to data center efficiency. And if there's any new services coming out of Twitter, they're based on Mesos. It's been in production at scale for two years. At this point, about 50% of their clusters, of their workloads in their compute total is running on Mesos. Uh, frankly, Hadoop is not yet running on Mesos. That's kind of an odd thing. But they, they put their services on it first. Their Hadoop stuff is very locked down. That's kind of a way to put it. Other people run Mesos largely because they can mix Hadoop with other things. But with Twitter, they're really focused on, on services. And again, they wanted the elasticity, but they had to run bare metal on premise. Airbnb, on the other hand, um, they wanted uh, cloud infrastructure that had flexibility. And they don't have a lot of engineers. You know, I mean, if you go to Twitter or Facebook, they've got a thousand engineers each. Um, I think I'm right about that. Yeah. And uh, but but Airbnb has it's basically it's a, it's a great company. It's a design firm, but they have a really talented engineering staff. But it, it's not as big as something on Twitter. So they had to manage a lot of moving parts with a relatively few number of engineers, and uh, this helps them reduce a lot of their ops overhead. It also allowed them to get away from elastic properties, which they are in trouble. Uh, as far as media coverage, uh, there have been some interesting articles. Uh, ben Lorica at Strata, uh, well, actually, ben, Ben's at O'Reilly Radar, but also one of the uh, organizers now for O'Reilly Strata. Uh, we've had some other interesting analysis out of uh, TechCrunch, Dr. Dr. Dobbs, GigaOM, etc. <clears throat> we did integration with TypeSafe. We uh, integrated the Play framework in Mesos. So uh, TypeSafe ran a blog, engineering blog post about that with James Ward. Um, that was a fun article. And we've been looking at doing more integration with TypeSafe as well. But Dean's not here tonight, is he? Uh, I, was, I was hoping to be able to razz Dean about this. I'll have to catch him. Um, Why don't you give him a good razz for the camera? Oh, good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dean, we miss you. We we're really looking forward to, to jabbing you a little bit here and there. But, but good stuff. Uh, hope all is going great at TypeSafe. I'm very excited about that. Um, as far as resources for Apache Mesos, uh, before I get into more like demos and QA, um, I'll just uh, provide a few links here. Uh, the project is mesos.apache.org. Um, the, the company that I'm from is mesosphere.io. We have some tutorials about how to deploy uh, things like Hadoop and Kronos, uh, putting up other tutorials about Spark and Storm and others, uh, probably a lot of Python as well. Uh, and there's the original paper, uh, the, the real quintessential paper about this is from Usenix, 2011. Uh, ben Hinman and company back at Berkeley did that. And then uh, putting on my O'Reilly author hat, um, I've been collecting notes about use cases and various presentations and papers. Um, but I've got a Google Doc that's public, and anything new that comes out, I'll, I'll put into the Google Doc. And, uh, and then a, couple, a few events coming up. <clears throat> There's going to be the first ever Mesos Unconference. We're actually trying to ramp up towards having a full-scale conference on this. We've got several companies involved. But we're going to have an Unconf. Uh, it's going to be at, at Twitter's headquarters in San Francisco uh, a little bit later this month. And uh, that was actually just posted today. Um, there's also a, a big shindig down in Austin uh, on January 11th. And it's called Day to Day Texas. Uh, we had about 350 people last year, right? I get the keynote on that. And we're expecting more about 450 or so this year. A lot of interesting data work at scale going on down in, in Texas. You know, between telecom and all the energy stuff and shipping and whatnot. Um, and then O'Reilly Strata, we're going to have a workshop specifically for Mesos, um, for some feather, things like that too. So uh, we'll have other meetups and all, but these are some of the big ones on the calendar. And of course, uh, I have to put in a plug. Um, the, what we were talking about last time I was here, I appreciated being able to present about cascading and 
we actually did finally get the book out. So um, the book got published in July, and I've uh, been doing a few signings on that. But if you're interested in cascading, um, I'll put in a plug. Um, I've also got a newsletter where I try to do a lot of summaries about conferences and open source projects that are coming out. So uh, check out the newsletter. I, I try to update it every month. Some days there's a little too much travel, but I'll get an update out there pretty soon. Um, and frankly, cascading and mesos fit together in the sense that the two big public use cases for both are in common. Uh, so Twitter in particular, but also Airbnb. So there's a lot of synergy between those, a lot of reasons for using them together. Hey, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, with respect to cascading and uh, Scala, the Scala framework, Yes. Uh, is there any anticipation that you're aware of currently that there's going to be a Java 8 iteration update? <laughs> It'd be nice if we could get to Java 7. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, with, res with respect to the Scala cascading scalding framework, do you know of anything that kind of brings that to Java 8? Because the parts of cascading that enable scalding, when you look at the Java 8 constructs, yes, yes, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a pain point. point. Um, yeah, no, that, that has been a pain point. Um, I know that the Chris and company at uh, Concurrent, um, I was working at Concurrent up until three or four months ago. Uh, definitely Concurrent is ramped up, and they came out with release 2.2, largely because of the NC SQL stuff in Lingual. Um, but then they, they had 2.3 in the works and 2.4 on the roadmap, and for whatever reason, they're coming out with 2.5 now. They've just pushed ahead, largely because of heading 2. They had to respond about Yarn. So I don't know how much they're going to update there, but I, I know that a lot of the earlier dependencies that we had on, on Java 6 were largely because of Hadoop. Um, partly some legacy stuff in cascading, but I know that they're, they're trying to get there. Um, I, I haven't heard particularly from Chris what his plans are for Java 8, um, but that would be a good question for him or Andre Calvay or something. I'll, I'll try to check that out. Definitely what's happening in Twitter is interesting. Summingbird has sort of become the big umbrella for that. So you've got Scalding and then Storm fitting into Summingbird. You've got Algebra that fits in and Matrix API. And so the revenue apps at Twitter are based on this platform. And yeah, that's kind of a big bugaboo. It's like how do we bring it up to the 21st century uh, without having a uh, escape only in fact. Uh, Sam Ritchie is probably the right person to ask. And uh, I've, I've heard rumors that Sam Ritchie may be uh, doing more talks out in the field. So that might be a good person to bring in here. I'll put, I'll put a bug in his ear. Alrighty, uh, let, me, let me show a few, uh, a few things here. I'll probably need glasses for this. Okay, so I, I've got a Mesos cluster running, and if my tether is okay, uh, maybe not. But I think my tether is okay. Um, I've got a Mesos cluster running here, and uh, it's, it's running on AWS just to do a demo. I mean, obviously, you'd want to run this on bare metal for a lot of reasons, but it's simple for me to show this one. Out the field. Um, I've got Hadoop running on it, and the framework is terminated. You're brilliant. Uh, okay, so let me let me show you how to run a framework. Thank you. Thank you. Ha! There we go. So I'm gonna, I'm, what I did was I, I SSH'd into uh, the Mesos master. And uh, right now I'm, I'm just launching a job tracker. I'm running CDH4, as you can see. Uh, so we got that running, and let's see if I come back in over here. Great. And I don't know how to spell sudo, apparently. Um, okay, so I've got some of that running now. If I come back here and take a look at my master, should be happy. 
Great. Okay. Just refresh that to make sure. Okay, great. So I had been running another framework, and frankly, I think I did a bad thing. I, I think I launched my job tracker. I didn't use NoHub. So when I was moving my laptop around, I probably killed it. Um, anyway, I've got another one launched right here. And if I, if I come in, you can see I've got a couple map, uh, map taps trackers and a reduced task tracker. I've got three of them. This is a small cluster just for demo. Um, but if I want to, I can drill down on that. I can take a look at, let's see, task tracker zero. zero. Take a look at a sandbox. And so there I've got a directory for that, um, that executor um, out on that slave. And it shows you what's running, my, my tarball from this Hadoop had come. Uh, if I want to, I can take a look at the errors down here. Hopefully nothing too weird. Good. Or I can take a look at standard out. And the nice thing about it is that these log files out on the slaves from the Mesos console, you can actually see the live updates. So if there was anything being appended, that would happen right on the console. Um, so it's an interesting way to go and essentially looking at the top level, you've got a list of all the different frameworks. Hadoop, maybe multiple Hadoops, maybe different vendors. Maybe you're running CDH and Hortonworks and MapR on the same cluster. Um, you, know, you can have Spark and MPI and all kinds of things running. But then you can drill down on frameworks and take a look at what kind of topology they have. And then for the individual executors, drill down and find out exactly what tasks they're running and what the log files are that are coming out of them. It's kind of a nice general way of, of having a console for, for different distributed systems. Um, another thing is, actually, so we had just launched this off of a tool called Elastic Mesos. And this is super secret. I, I have not demoed this before. This is the first audience. Actually, I'm, I'm a little bit leery because this is pre-release. So I know that my team is actually doing commits while I'm talking. Um, they, they actually went on a, uh, a retreat to Hawaii um, while I'm traveling. So. Um, um, Hopefully we won't get any commits from Hawaii while we're, we're done with it. <laughs> um, but in there, there's a couple of tutorials. So if you want to learn about how to install and run Hadoop on Mesos, uh, we've got a, a tutorial here that takes you step by step how to SSH into the master, how to pull down uh, your, your top all distro, and uh, steps to getting that launched. And, and really, the only changes that have to happen there um, to really leverage Mesos with Hadoop, you want to subclass the job tracker and task tracker. You want to subclass the job tracker so that it can receive offers. And then you want to subclass the task tracker so that it can consume those offers. So we've rewritten those for CDH and we're rewriting them for MapR. Maybe we'll do that for other distros too. Um, but it's a pretty simple change. And then from there, you just want to make sure that you've got all the endpoints defined. Uh, as far as Mesos master and, and, uh, and what's going on with the task record in terms of your Hadoop config. So we, we step through here and then we show, um, I've got a little tutorial going on here where I show uh, how to take uh, word count that ships with uh, Apache Hadoop and uh, just run a real simple couple of files through it um, and what that looks like in Mesos. Great. And again, you can look at the standard out. Um, there's really no difference at that point. It's basically Hadoop running on a cluster with the nice side effect that you can leverage Mesos to make Hadoop elastic. You can add resources to it or take them away. You can also run multiple Hadoop clusters in the same cluster, uh, as well as other things. Uh, if you want to see about Kronos, uh, there's another tutorial here about that. Uh, basically, again, SSH in the master, and pull down a, a tarball to run it. Um, and then this is a start script. From there, Kronos is, is essentially a distributed, uh, distributed cron. And I show some examples of where I launch sleep. Just a very, very simple task. And it runs. You can see it from the console and what kind of output it produced. And then I go in and I create a very small dependency graph. I have one sleep job that leads into an echo. So I, I create one of those, and then I create my echo, and then I can take a look and see what my dependency graph is for things that are scheduled. So that's kind of management that Kronos gives you. 
this all came out of Airbnb, by the way. When, uh, when Florian Leibert had left uh, Twitter and joined Airbnb, their revenue apps were based on a thousand line bash script. So they had this bash script that was supposed to run every day. And in reality, since it was a thousand lines of bash, it ran successfully about once a week. Um, so they were having a little bit of trouble. So Kronos was born out of that, where they wanted to unwind this huge script and just run a lot of essentially a bunch of dependency graphs for Hadoop jobs and various scripts that they had to run. Okay, and then you can see that was right. Um, one other thing, or a couple of things I'll point out. If you want to take a look at how to get started programming a framework in Mesos, uh, probably the, the Python that we did for the Docker integration is probably the best tutorial for that. It's actually not a lot of code. But we've got a, a similar kind of tutorial written in Scala, but I think probably the Python one is most approachable. Um, again, it, it's not very much. And we have a few of these. We have a mesh. Uh, there's the stuff that we did for Play Framework. And there's a couple flavors of what we did for Docker. So I definitely recommend those if you want to get started writing frameworks. Uh, also, in terms of the documentation, uh, we're trying to do a lot of work on the Apache site. So uh, you know, we're starting to put more and more docs on there. Uh, starting to reference more and more use cases as well. Okay, great. Um, that's what I got. Any questions? Um, so one question that's been plaguing me is, a um, lot of teams are hesitant at running Hadoop over SAM. Um, and uh, there's been inclination towards running to have bare metal data nodes and push me on top of it. Um, so right now, we are sort of experimenting with SAM uh, with the cluster with storage on time. So how do you think this is going to be great for that? Huh, can you repeat the question? Uh, well, the, if I may, if I can paraphrase, correct me. Yeah, sure. um, so, you know, one of the issues as far as, as running Hadoop with SAN, and how could Mesos address if there are ways to be able to uh, manage resource isolation, resource sharing better? Um, well, one of the things, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm thinking about it. Because um, that's actually interesting, I haven't run across that before. Um, and I'd like to talk a bit more about that offline. But uh, one of the things with Mesos is that the C groups, the resource descriptors, um, they can be added. You can go in and create descriptors for really anything. Um, so if there's any, any issue of data locality or uh, any kind of resource contention, um, that would be one way to just factor that into the resource offers that are going out to essentially the task tracker executives. Um, as far as consuming it, I don't know if you'd have to subclass the task tracker or not. I'd have to check about that if you wanted to add that. But it, it probably shouldn't be a whole lot of code. Hey, are there any particular issues, though, as far as like resource isolation? Um, not, not that we've come across yet. OK, I'll check. I'll, I'll ask Ben and others about that. But that's, that's a good question. Um, other questions? Do you have a rough timeline on when uh, integration with MapR will be available for Mesos? Um, well, so I was at Strata last week, and uh, while I was at the MapR cocktail party, a, a gentleman named Ted Deming came up very, very uh, abruptly and was like, "We've got to get going on this now." Um, so we've been talking back and forth and trying to identify like who's going to work on it. Um, I think the ball's in our court, uh, and we know what we need to do. It's a matter of uh, there's been a very busy conference schedule for all parties involved. Uh, but you know, we're coming into the end of the year and the conference has died down. So um, I'm hoping that within the next couple of months we'll have it. Is it a matter of, uh, for plugging in the frameworks, a matter of hours of work in most cases, or? Yeah. I mean, okay. in Scala, it's like 100 lines of Scala to completely build a new framework. And so we have essentially templates that you can use. When they wrote Kronos as a framework, Kronos has no network code. So it's no single point of failure, distributed cron, without a line of network code. Um, so that's kind of the power of having these frameworks, is because you're letting the kernel do that hard work for you, the distributed kernel, essentially. Uh, but, the, but the boilerplate that was required, it's, it's down to about 100 lines of scholar. Is there a complete list of all the frameworks that are currently built and available? 
yes, that's a really good question. Um, and if I get to docs, uh, let's see. I know that this is not, I, I know of a couple others that have been added. Um, but certainly, okay, so Hadoop, Spark, a couple flavors of MPI, um, Jenkins, Kronos, Marathon. There's a new one from Twitter, which is going to be out soon, called Aurora, uh, which is, yeah, it's Aurora, it's like Marathon, but a little bit more industrial strength. Uh, there's also Hybrid Table, uh, Docker, Play Framework. There's a new one called Chaos, which has been released. It's on GitHub, but it has to do with uh, REST endpoints uh, and managing that kind of service discovery inside of a cluster. Uh, and then there's another one called DPAC for distributed Python. It came out of a company, a large data company in China. Um, I, I don't have a lot of hands on with it, but I want to track up and down. Um, there's a couple other projects that I've heard of uh, out of Beijing. Um, some pretty interesting work there. Um, I know of another large company that has a framework that they have not released yet. Uh, they, they, they tend to rent a lot of videos, but I, I can't speculate as to their name in public. Uh, <laughs> but they're allegedly doing some kind of a real-time processing framework on it. Uh, let's see, Storm is not on the list. So that's another one. You know, Nathan Mars did a Storm integration on Mesos, but then Eric Nakbar has gone in and, and boosted that up a bit. We've, we've had him do a lot more work on Mesos lately. Um, so, you know, that's a list. It's about 10 so far, but we're, we're definitely getting further. And in one of your slides, it looked like you had Jetty listed on there? No, well, you know, I mean, Jetty works. It doesn't really have to be a framework. Right. But yeah. it works, yeah. Same with Rails. You don't have to do anything with Rails to make this work. So there's nothing magical to do to get Tomcat to work on it? Oh, no, no, that's trivial. It's trivial. In fact, that's that's sort of our default. If, if Toby Knaup was here, he, 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 Toby is one of the co-founders of Mesos here. He was one of the original engineers at Airbnb, and he led their growth. Um, and he really led a lot of the, the Mesos build out at, at, uh, at Airbnb. Um, if he were here, the demo that he does is he takes uh, like a Sinatra app and has it wrapped up as a tarball, and then basically untar it and CDN and run a script. And he fires that off across the cluster, runs it on Marathon, and then he goes out and starts killing them and seeing them reemerge elsewhere. Um, so if you're working with Tomcat or Jetty or Sinatra or something like that, a fairly lightweight kind of service, this is trivial to deploy. Um, if you've got something that touches more of the OS in a lot of places, wrap containerizing it. Something like Docker makes a lot of sense. Um, the caveat with Docker, though, the story's not over. I mean, there's, there's a lot of popularity in the Bay Area with Docker, but um, one of the problems with Docker is they made some uh, choices <laughs> for their file system representation, at UFS, um, which I don't, we, I don't know that anybody likes it at this point, and we might back that out. Um, also, the way that they do it kind of obscures the ability to collect a lot of statistics that you want for capacity planning, things like that. So Docker is not really the end-all, be-all, but they are evolving. Um, but if you had a more substantial kind of web app, you might want to but if, for something like Jetty, Tarball works great. How, how is there a migration involved if you want to uh, go from plain Hadoop cluster to Hadoop running on Mesos? Well, I mean, in terms of the cluster, I, I mean, you could, you could run it on Mesos already. If you wanted to get some of the elasticity of the, the resource offers and be able to ramp up or down you know, task trackers that you have out there, get more of that high availability that comes out of Mesos, then you have to subclass the job tracker and task tracker and just twiddle a few things inside the config files. But we actually have a tutorial about that. Uh, let me try this one. Uh, it's under mesosphere.io slash learn. And uh, there's a tutorial here. Uh, this went up yesterday. I saw a commit. I saw a pull request pending, so it may actually change. But I have to. Uh, I I just found it today while I was traveling, and I have to change a few things here. Uh, but it, it goes into step by step. If you just take CDH4 off the shelf, what does it require to run? 
And at one point here, we talk about the Torah prophet who was for the classics, the two classics of the classroom. But it, it's not a lot of um, it's a lot of work. Plan. And it's up and running. And then from there, the rest of it is just like what I, I'd shown in the other tutorial where we run, uh, yeah, we just run that. Uh, people, people have migrated from their existing hundreds of nodes of cluster. Yes. So that, that was Airbnb really started out doing this because they wanted to run Hetty plus Storm plus Park plus Rails um, and have those pretty closely integrated. Um, and so that continues to be their, their case. As far as the other use cases, that's actually a pretty interesting question. I can think about what I've seen. Um, Media Crossing, they do sort of a cross between finance and ads. It's basically you know real-time bid system for, for ad employees and offers. Um, and they got into this, I'm, I'm just about ready to publish their case study, and they got into this because of needing to run Hadoop and Spark together. Uh, and so that's another one that's crossed that bridge. Um, open tables, some Hadoop. HubSpot is more services. Device scape and share through and key, I, I, I still have to find out more about what they're really doing. Um, categorizing it a little bit, that was more analytics. But uh, definitely media crossing and Airbnb were the two big heading cases. And, and, and Twitter's trying to get there too. They're just being a little, how should I say, they're being rather conservative right now because they're weeks away from their IPO. <laughs> their lawyers are having a lot of say if I if I'm in these in bold. Smart Ah, very good. So um, one of the things about Mesos, uh, which which I find is, is kind of a default answer out of uh, Berkeley PhD students or PhD students in general, but everything's pluggable. So uh, <laughs> they they uh, definitely you know came out with some good instances of, of things such as scheduler, such as distributed file system. Um, it's kind of down the line, but then they made them all very much pluggable. Uh, so, fair scheduler is there by default, but that can be changed. Uh, we haven't done a lot of work in terms of scheduling algorithms yet, um, but that's actually one of my reasons for joining the company. And also other people that I would like to be working with, but that's their interest as well. So uh, one of the things is that you can collect some pretty good fine grain metrics for actual utilization. And because you're operating down, you're using C groups, you're operating down in the kernel, you can grab metrics at that level to say what was really used over time. And this is interesting because when you look at what people are allocating when they're provisioning apps in a cluster, uh, generally human beings over allocate enormously just to be safe. The actual usage by the machines is much, much less. So that's one interesting thing that we're finding is by using those metrics, we can find out really tighter controls and capacity planning. And of course, we need to have that before we go back to the other level of having smarter scheduling. So that's one dimension. So we really got to get the metrics down and do the time series analysis on that to be able to do smarter algorithms and scheduling. Number two, though, scheduling is an interesting thing. When we talk about resource offers, currently this is a two-level scheduler kind of model, to use Google's terminology. But really, when you're scheduling in terms of orchestrating a lot of mixed workloads on a cluster, uh, it's more of a three-level problem. Um, so how can I how can say You've got the resources being provisioned in terms of, of distributed kernel and, and what's there in the hardware. You've got processes and tasks that are running up above. So if you have a certain expected workload coming in, you may need to auto-scale. You may need to ramp up services of a certain class. But there's another level of scheduling that's at a, at a higher conceptual level that has to do with uh, more of a control, more of a, a higher level of orchestration. Uh, in some cases, you may need to run particular workloads, particular analytics, to determine what else needs to go into your dependency graph. So you have to step outside of the dependency graph, run those, analyze the results, and then figure out what else to fire off. So I've been working on a project to put a generalized PetriNet controller over the top as like a third level. Um, and that would feed into the scheduling, making the scheduling smarter, effectively. Um, 
So we're, we're, we're trying to understand algorithmically how we're going to approach this, but that's kind of the thing. So, so how the heartbeat is being monitored? Heartbeat, heartbeat. Heartbeats? Yeah. Uh, well, there, I mean, there, there, are, there are definitely some places where there are things like heartbeats. There are other places where there are not because they would be bottlenecks. Um, and and I, will, I, I, I will definitely step up to the plate and say that Ben Hinman would be the right person to ask that question. I mean, this was part of his thesis, and I can't paraphrase what he's, I've heard him say a couple times before. But there were selections made where they could get rid of heartbeats. It was actually quite a bottleneck in the system. So I'll defer to him. Um, but I can look that up and provide you an answer. Can Mesos uh, run with two data centers or a combination of a physical data center and a cloud? That, that's that's a, a great question because we've definitely seen those. And um, yes, that's actually what this is intended for as well. Um, I mean, Google's case, Google, you know, back in the day, made the decision to have data centers run apps in a data center, whereas Amazon had the smaller data centers and the frameworks that would cross over. So Dynamo versus Bigtable is the classic distinction between multiple data centers that are shared versus large ones that are stable. Um, and Mesos coming from more of the Google side of the, of the house, uh, you know, definitely has been focused on just a large warehouse computing thing. Um, but there are provisions in there for being able to do resources outside of what's running on your core, uh, particularly on the network. So uh, that, that is an area that I know that Ben has been looking at. I know that some large telecom companies which build data centers for a living have been asking about that. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing more and more about an evolution of smaller, more ubiquitous data centers. Um, and so we, we're definitely trying to, to move forward. There, there was a paper that, that Ben had pointed out out of Stanford, um, IQ, E-Y-E-Q, research, SDN research at Stanford recently. And uh, that was one that he was identifying as being pretty close, pretty close to it. Yes. Um, can, uh, can uh, yes, that's a great question about Cassandra. Because um, again, that's another kind of workload. And the interesting thing with Cassandra is that it really does have some expectations of how the JVM is tuned on the leaves in the cluster, and it's pretty picky about that. And it, it usually, you know, both Cassandra and Hadoop have the habit of just taking over the node that they're on. So process isolation is pretty important if you're going to do mixed workloads. Um, I've been working with a project called Titan, which is graph queries on top of Cassandra and HBase. And that's one of the things we're looking at is using Mesos to balance do that isolation. Um, Twitter uses a lot of Cassandra, but they weren't doing Mesos underneath. Those were older cases. Um, but there's another company and I have not gotten permission to mention them publicly. I actually know two companies that I can't talk about publicly yet um, that are doing very large scale use of Cassandra. And I know that one of them is most certainly doing work with Mesos. The other one, I'm not sure about the pretty opaque. Okay. Um, but it, there wouldn't be anything to look up. We, just, we haven't published a use case yet. Other questions? So, if I wanted to take just, let's pull a couple of big things, easy things to identify that would be running in most companies. Uh, let's say I've got some web services running. Yep. Let's just go simple. Let's say they're in Tomcat. Sure. And then I've got Hadoop. Okay. Now, the obvious to me is, okay, everyone's going to build their Hadoop cluster, and then they're going to take their Tomcat application, running their web services, and they might put one, two, three, four of those behind an Apache. Primarily at service. Web server, distribute the load for those. What does that kind of look like in the Mesos world? Okay, great. So the idea there is that uh, you can probably get some efficiencies by doing the mixed workloads. Utilization, leveling out the utilization curves, and also cutting down the latency if maybe Hadoop is producing something that Tomcat is consuming. Um, there's the load balancing. Um, I've had a couple of companies looking at Mesos for that. If I remember correctly, HubSpot has built this into Marathon uh, with a plug-in for their load balancer. Um, 
I'm not even gonna, I, I don't know, so I'm not gonna say. I, I think I remember what it was, but I'm gonna be careful. Um, but we made that plug open so you can get some input back in. Um, I don't know if I can say it or not, Yammer was also looking at this. They had a big load balancing problem. Or not problem, but they had a, a use case for this. Uh, so we're definitely, they've been working with that. Um, the idea is that it's not very hard to build something like auto scaling into this. Because when you're running Marathon on Mesos, uh, it's got HA proxy built into it. So when you deploy, each app has, uh, how can I put this? Basically, HA proxy is watching the services, it's doing service discovery. So if something dies, it knows about it, it can send a message back to Marathon saying, hey, something's gone, I need to launch another. Um, so we're leveraging HA proxy for part of the high availability. Um, so that's where the Tomcat would come in. That would be applied there. And uh, the idea is that with load balancing, you want to figure out you know, how are you auto scaling this. Do you need to bring up more Tomcat instances? Or can you pull some back and then ramp up more of what you're doing on your batch? Because the requirements make it. Um, so that kind of orchestration might be important. Definitely some companies have different batch requirements at different times a day. So in that concept, if you have your Apache web server yeah. sitting out there, right, that's your front door coming in, is there something that you have to do special to make it work with however many Tomcats you're going to have in your isolation environment? No, no, I mean, if you're running them all in the same cluster, they're running on top of this distributed kernel, this isolation. Um, nothing special there. Um, how do you, it's, it's not, it's a nice to have to be able to have this elasticity. Because before, you couldn't ramp up slots. I mean, this is something new with Hadoop. But before, there's, and there's still are issues of where Hadoop isn't quite as flexible as you might want it. So Mesos can add some of them. But as far as being able to understand what capacity you're running out there in your cluster, in terms of the number of instances of Hadoop that are being fronted by, by Apache, um, that's where you could get some pretty interesting metrics coming back, feeding back into your system as far as uh, you know, maybe some Q metrics or something to tell you that your Tomcat instances are way overloaded, so let's fire up some more. Or maybe we could take some down. Um, I know that HubSpot was building that into Marathon. I haven't seen the commits on that yet, but they, they were building another scaling feature into it as part of the resource uh, planning. Seems like a very appealing use case. Yeah, you know, that I, I'm doing a lot of workshops, uh, intro to data science kind of workshops, and, and one of the things we've been building out for those is, is showing something like that. Having a web app where people are um, uh, interacting with the web app in the class and then generating log files that we're slicing and dicing in Hadoop. Um, so I'm trying to show that actually in the course, uh, uh, essentially how you put together some batch and some services. And, and yeah, if you, if you put the, the patch in front end on it too, that or a cache layer too, if you have the web cache layers. I went simple, those are, all of those things, they so stack together in my mind, so why would I want to build two 16 node clusters for those two use cases when I could slap them together and fully utilize as much of it as possible for each of the use cases? And, and especially when you look at the utilization curves over time, um, you know, the distribution on that, of different types of resources, RAM versus CPU, uh, looking at something like Hadoop versus memcache, uh, they're very complementary. So you really get a lot by stacking together. Other questions? Yeah. So compared to Condor, right? You guys are replacing Condor? It's totally different. I love Condor. I know. I hope we're not replacing it. Um, no, I think Condor would, would fit over the top. And I actually, uh, you know, Jason Stowe is, is a good friend. Um, I really like cycle computing and what's been going on with Condor in, in the general case. But cycle has done some pretty amazing work with it. Uh, no, it's not replacing that. Um, one of the real reasons for Mesos being initiated was to be able to have things like MPI and Spark and, and Hadoop all coexist. So I could definitely see Condor running alongside of this. Um, there is the notion of resource offers, but it's a very different kind of resource yeah. offers. Um, so I, I could definitely see Condor, you know, being able to run alongside of, say, Hadoop and Storm and things like that by using Mesos. Um, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, do they compete? Maybe for some use cases, yes, but probably not in general. 
Are, are you using Condor? Yeah, I do. Uh, what, what, what kind of uh, use case? What, what kind of workloads, if I may ask? Basically, we, we go out to, uh, we have a couple of VMs, like hundreds of VMs, just go out to grab web pages. Um, so, farm out. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I mean, I could make the case, too, for actually, this is something I should probably run by, Jason. Jason. Um, uh, I can make the case for building an executor for Condor. So we have a scheduler, Condor has own scheduler, you know, which secure and that's really have more memory when they just send jobs there and we run right? Yeah, I, 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 the concept I think is Mesel will do the same thing, basically it's a resource manager in the kind Well it, it it's a it's a level lower. It's, yeah. it's a level lower than that, because Condor really is more a matter of probably Condor runs more into Chronos. But Condor is more sophisticated than Chronos. Um, so I could really see Condor having an executor written in Mesos and then leveraging the distributed kernel. Um, it would give you some things at the kernel level. It would give you some isolation, some better guarantees than what it probably currently has. Possibly down the road, some security features as well. Like that. Well, Condor is straightforward. Right? You saw that you put it on the box, you can do whatever you want. Right? Yeah. I mean, Mesos is very, very intrusive, I think. I mean, it's very kind of just and change. I have slap on Mesa on every box, right? Then can I run some other job on my own or kind of? Yeah, I mean, Mesos is running its its secrets. It's in the kernel already. So uh, I mean, as long as you have secrets, as long as you have like 2.6 later, mm -hmm. it's it's not really intrusive in the sense that it's the Linux kernel that's really running under the hood. Um, we run a Mesos uh, masters, but we just run a few of those, and then we have the Mesos slaves. And think of like agents on the cluster. Leaves. Um, no, I, they could definitely coexist. Um, I would think that the way that that uh, Condor does its sort of classified ads yeah. uh, has some overlap with Chronos, and I could definitely see an executor being written. That's a, that's a good point. I think we're done. All right. Thank Thanks you very much. I really appreciate it.